John here, Old Hickory Forge. Welcome back. If it's your first time here, welcome. So, what's going on today? I'm down here in the shop. I got a pretty cool project I want to bring you guys along for. What I got here, you know, real nice rusty old anvil. If you've ever bought a rusty old anvil, you know the common way to clean it off is with a cup brush and a grinder and WD-40 and this, that, and the other. But that makes a lot of mess. It's a lot of work. I want to try something different. I want to try a process called electrolysis, which is something I've never done before. So I'm going to bring you guys along for it, but uh, let's take a closer look at what we got. So... Just taking a closer look before we get started. This is a really cool anvil for a lot of reasons, and I'm going to kind of explain why as we go. First things first, it's clearly a forged English anvil. It's wrought iron. There's a hard steel face. I can see the seam of the forge weld. You probably can't see it on camera too good. Once it's cleaned up, you'll be able to. There's no markings to speak of, which doesn't surprise me, because for another reason, there is no pritchel. And what that means is this was made prior to 1830. And a lot of times, anvils that old really didn't have markings on them, or they were added later. So, as of now, I can't see any. That doesn't mean they're not there. It's, you know, pretty heavily rusted. But what's really cool and what gives this anvil a lot of character to me is this was made back during a time when everything was done by hand and by eye. They didn't have precision machinery that did a lot of the work for them. You know, the horn is not centered. It's not perfectly straight. The hardy hole is crooked. The entire anvil is crooked. If you can kind of see, it's kind of tweaked that way. The feet aren't perfectly perpendicular to the rest of the anvil. So, uh, to me, that gives, that just gives this old boy a lot of character. So, we're going to get it cleaned up and see if we can get some life back into it. So, before we get started, just wanted to show you, you know, that face is nearly dead flat. There's a little bit of sway here in the center, but that's, you know, a sixteenth of an inch, maybe. So, this thing is in excellent condition considering its age. It's still perfectly serviceable. If I was mounting this up and using it, I would just wire wheel off the top and call it good. But because this is going to be a display piece, you know, I want this whole thing to look really nice. So, uh, let's get started. So, here is what we got. Now, quick note, everything I learned about electrolysis, I learned from watching a video by a channel called Wood Magazine. How it actually works on a scientific level, I have no idea. I'm just going to say it's magic. So basically, we got four steel anodes in each corner of our, uh, you know, our fancy little plastic tub here. They're hooked to these copper wires. Copper is daisy-chained all the way around the bend so the current can pass all the way around. We got a steel wire hooked to the hardy hull of our anvil that's hooked to our negative lead. Our positive lead is hooked to one of our anodes. From what I understand, you don't actually want any of your copper submerged in the solution itself because it'll dissolve and make a huge mess. But what we got over here, just a plain old car battery charger. That's what we're going to be using to, uh, you know, put the electrical current to this thing. And uh, we'll see what happens. I've never done this before, so I'm pretty excited to see how it goes. Important note, this isn't just water in here. It's water with this here uh, washing soda mixed in. You can use baking soda too. But you just need about one tablespoon per gallon of water. There's about 15 gallons in there, so I put about 15 tablespoons in here. Again, what this actually does, I have no idea. I'm going to assume it's magic. But uh, let's see what happens. Safety concerns real quick. Like, whenever this thing is plugged in and turned on and whatnot, there's going to be electrical current flowing through all the metal bits as well as the water. So your best bet is just not to touch any of it while it's plugged in. Also, the chemical reaction that takes place is going to produce pure hydrogen and pure oxygen, both of which are combustible gases. So do it in a well-ventilated area away from any sparks or open flames and whatnot, and uh, you should be fine. So this here is actually about three hours later. It turned out that little battery charger actually cut off after about the first 30 minutes for some reason. But I got it turned back on, got it squared away, and you can see, you know, something is definitely going on in there. So I'm really excited to see what this thing looks like in the morning. So here it is the next morning. I'm going to pull all the water out and see what it looks like, and maybe I'll run it through for a little longer. So here we are after the first run through. A lot of rust has been removed, but there's still a lot there. So I'm going to run this thing through again, and I'm going to change a few things. I think I can kind of optimize the process a little bit. But I uh, still can't see any markings. So we'll carry on with the experiment. So here's what we've done. we got the same solution about 15 gallons of water, about 15 tablespoons of the washing soda. I swapped these up for some bigger anodes. Best I can figure, it draws the rust away from the uh, the part and it cakes up on the anodes. I was using a couple of pieces of 3 8 inch round and they were just caked in rust. So I got some bigger anodes and I've wrapped the tie wire on the waist of the anvil to hopefully get a more secure connection before I just had it looped through the hardy hole. Now that a lot of the thick surface rust is gone, it appears to be working a little better. So uh, we'll see what happens. So here we are about another 24 hours later. A whole lot of rust has settled down on the bottom. You can kind of see how the anodes are like caked in it now. My theory is that the positively charged anodes, you know, pull the rust away from the negatively charged part. Uh, somebody brought up on Instagram that surface area of the anodes makes a difference. 
And I have noticed from going from that 3 8 round to this 5 8 square, it does seem to be, you know, working better. But anyway, we'll pull it out of there and see what we got. So here we are to just wiping this thing down with some water and a rag. It's still wet. I didn't want to use WD-40 or anything like that because I don't know if that'll contaminate the solution when I put it back in. I do think I'm going to run it through at least one more time because there's still, it's a lot better than it was, but it's still not clean. It seems like the thinner areas of the anvil, like the horn and the very back of the heel are almost completely rust free at this point, but the main body's got a ways to go. I tell you, this thing must have been either buried in the ground or left unprotected to the elements for a long time because that's some really, really deep pitting. So, uh... Let me show you something else kind of cool. Really though. old anvils like this were made with what's called a build-up method, where basically the horn, heel, feet, and face would all be forge welded onto a central block. And you can very clearly see seams of a forge weld where the heel was put on right there, as well as where the feet were put on both sides there. You can see them on the underside too, right there, as well as the underside of the horn. So that's kind of cool. Fun fact, uh, Peter Wright anvils, the reason they say solid rot is because... Uh, they went to great lengths to make the entire body of the anvil from one piece of wrought iron rather than building it up like this. That's why you often see these old anvils with the horns and the heels broken off is because those forge welds aren't good. Here in the southern United States, there's somewhat of a folk legend that uh, when General William Tecumseh Sherman marched through the south, he had his men break all the anvils to make it harder for Confederate cavalry to fit horseshoes. There's really no verifiable historical account of that ever actually happening. Personally, I wouldn't put it past him. But uh, that's just something that, you know, people with damaged anvils will say to try to make them more valuable. It's just kind of cool. You can really plainly see. It's hard to capture on camera, but, you know, just kind of interesting. I've hit a few snags with this project. So uh, the little car battery charger I was using quit working, and uh, I couldn't really figure out why. It turns out they tend to short out really quick if you connect them to stuff other than car batteries. So uh, luckily I had an electrician buddy who hooked me up with this here 12-volt uh, DC power source, which is working really good. But uh, while I was messing around with the car battery, trying to figure out what was wrong, you know, I thought I just didn't really have a good connection, so I cleaned off the anode that my positive was hooked to. And uh, now that I've done that, you can see it's attracted the rust a lot faster than all the others. So what I kind of want to do is cut the power, take all the anodes out, clean them off, and then keep going just to see what happens. I'm having a lot of fun with this project. This is pretty interesting. I don't know if you can see or not. With the anodes being cleaned off, it's definitely working significantly faster. But the spots where the anvil is closer to the anodes seem to be working faster. So I don't know if, like, the charge loses power as it passes through the solution or anything like that, you know. One of you electricians in the comments tell me, I'm just, uh, you know, if I just wanted the anvil clean, I would have taken a wire wheel to it and been done in 15 minutes. But this is just something I've always wanted to try. So uh, let's uh, see what happens. Alrighty, so here we are for day three, so about 72 hours total in the solution. Let's pull it out of there and see what we got. So here we are for three days. Looks pretty good. It looks about like it would if you'd taken a wire wheel to it. But uh, I'm going to change out the solution, clean off the anodes, and keep going. You know, it's not really something you can overdo. So uh, I just want to see how clean we can get this thing. Having a lot of fun. I feel like a mad scientist. Alrighty, it's been another day, and I've let the solution kind of settle to show you what I'm talking about. You know, looks like all that rust. There seems to be an endless amount of rust coming off of this thing. I don't really know how far I can push it or how it's going to look when it's done. I do think I'm going to swap these anodes out for some sheet metal to get some more surface area. And then we'll keep going and see what happens. So after talking to a few folks, I learned that you actually don't need to change the solution every time. But you do need to go through and clean the anodes because once they get caked with rust, they don't really conduct electricity as well. I've also swapped the uh, square bar for some nice uh, big pieces of sheet metal. Lots of surface area should help pull the rust away. I don't really know how far I'm going to go with this, so I'm just running with it. So uh, let's put the juice to it and see what happens. So having swapped the anodes out for the sheet metal, thinking that it would, uh, you know, give more surface area to pull the rust away, now it doesn't seem to be working. So I'm thinking maybe there's just not enough power going in there to make the reaction happen, you know, with the bigger pieces of steel. So I'm going to put these babies back in and see what happens. Alrighty, so I got up with my electrician buddy, told him what was going on. He's like, you probably blew the fuse in that little power supply. Turned out that's what happened. I don't know why I'm having such bad luck with this project. But he brought over this here. I don't know what in the world it is. He said it was a uh, charger that came off a big diesel truck or something. But we're putting a lot more juice into the anvil now. So it's, it's cooking real good. So I'm going to leave that overnight and pull it out of there and see what we got. So here we are after about 16 hours of being hooked to this monstrosity right here. Let's uh, 
cut the power, pull it out of there. I've also learned that apparently there's like kind of like a black crud when you pull it out that hardens up and doesn't really show you your true surface that you need to scrub off immediately. So we'll pull it out of there, give it a quick scrub of the wire brush, wipe it down, see what we got and see if we need to keep going. But I don't know how in the world much more rust could possibly come off of this thing. Alrighty, after about 20 minutes with a wire brush and a bunch of rags, we got all the black crud off and here is what we got. That's pretty cool. I think it's almost down to true metal. So I'm going to, I'm going to call it here. Here's a closer look at some of the seams of the forge weld I was talking about. You know, there's the heel. There's the feet. Underside of the horn, you can really, really tell where it was put on. So Another it's pretty cool. I find really cool about this anvil personally is the rebound is really inconsistent. You see, if we go to different parts of the anvil, we have more or less rebound. Now, really old anvils were faced with a material called shear steel. Basically, you'd have wrought iron, you would put it in a carbon pack and bake it for a certain number of hours to get blister steel. It's kind of like case hardening the carbon through the phenomenon of carbon migration. The carbon imbues into the surface of the steel a certain distance depending on how long it was baked and what temperatures. But then you would take these uh, basically cased carburized pieces of blister steel and you would forge weld them together and again through the phenomenon of carbon migration you'd have what was called shear steel which was a semi-homogeneous hardenable piece of steel before modern tool steels were a thing that's what they used for any tool or bladed weapon or anything like that so you know at the end of the day it was kind of a guessing game like you know it was a trial and error process that was done by skill by hand and by eye and what that also tells me is the heat treat on this thing may not have been perfect the way these were heat treated is they basically sit the base in a pool of water and they had another running stream of water that would cool the face. And uh, you know, it might not have, the quench might not have been perfect. So that, uh, you know, that to me, that gives this old boy a lot of character. So just for comparison's sake, what I got here, this is my main shop anvil. This is a modern cast tool steel anvil. And all the way up and down, even back here on the heel, where there's not a lot of mass, the rebound is the same. So this was made using modern casting and uh, crucible technology and heat treating and everything. So. You know, it just kind of shows the staunch difference between the way it used to be done and the way it's done now. So, all in all, I'd say the electrolysis experiment was a success. Is it something I would recommend? Well, it kind of depends. If you're in a hurry and you just want a us usable anvil, a wire brush and a, on a grinder or something like that would be a lot faster. That takes about 15 minutes. This was done over the course of about four and a half days. Now, to be fair, I did screw up the process a few times. We hit a few snags. But, uh, you know, to me, that's part of the learning process. You know, I've always been a very hands-on learner. So stumbling through this experiment, screwing it up a bunch, I learned more and had more fun than I ever would have done reading 100 books about electrolysis. So there's that. But uh, we got this baby cleaned up real nice. This is going to be a decorative piece that's going to go in my house. You know, I know there are a lot of people out there who cringe at the thought of anvils being used as decorative pieces. But, you know, this old boy's led a long and productive life, and I think it's about time to retire him. No markings to speak of have been found, no maker's marks, no weight markings, which doesn't surprise me with anvils this old. I'm gonna kind of go out on a limb and say I think it's an Alsop because I had another one that was similar in shape and a lot of anvils in the late 17th, early 1800s, they didn't have cutting tables and Alsop anvils did, which, you know, this leads me to think this that's what this is. It could also be a really early mouse hole, but uh, how do you like that? Pretty freaking cool, I think. But uh, that's all I got for you. If you liked what you saw, like, share, subscribe, all that jazz. Always more cool stuff coming. Patrons of the channel, big thanks to you guys. And uh, y'all take care.